Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast. Today I'm talking to Kevin P. Gildy. Hello Kevin. Hiya, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Now there is so much to talk to you about, <laughs> I wasn't sure where to start, but I think the place to start is with your upcoming Edinburgh Fringe show, um, Suffering from Scottishness. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so Suffering from Scottishness is... Uh, a dark comedy, it's a immersive theatre show, it's a focus group, it's a cabaret <laughs> show of Scottish identity, uh, it's yeah, it's a bit of experimental theatre basically and uh, it's kind of bringing together lots of different strands of my career, loads of stuff I've worked on so there's a bit of poetry in there, um, there's a bit of kind of script writing, there's a bit of uh, music, there's a bit of um, like weird kind of postmodern stuff as well that I like to kind of uh, put into my work. So yeah, it's a, a kind of coming together of lots of different things under this really high concept uh, idea. Because to give people a bit of background, I think I first uh, came across you'd work with the Glasgow Cross, uh-huh. your, your band. Yeah. And then uh, through Sonic Youth, the spoken word uh, night you do. Yeah. Um, where, which is which are kind of cabaret nights, and we'll talk about both of those later mm-hmm. on. But so this really is a show which has taken uh, all the strands that you've worked on uh, uh-huh. over the years and trying to put them into one put hour long show. Put is it? Ten hour, yeah, <laughs> which is a, a hard task. But yeah, so the, the the basic concept of the show is that I am uh, playing a character. I'm playing Joe, and he is a consultation rep for. Citizen Scotland. Citizen Scotland is a fictitious government department. So th- this is kind of set post Brexit, uh, and in the wake of Brexit, Scotland has been given a few devolved powers to keep us sweet. Right. Uh, and one of those powers is over our own citizenship. So we get to have our own citizenship test. Um, so I am there to kind of road test some of the potential questions that we might ask someone if they're coming to to Scotland to be a citizen of the country. So like this idea of a citizen test that was always yes. thrown about the place, that's the uh-huh. all right, okay. So it's an interactive citizenship test, so we say, you know, and the audience votes for each question after each section. So I say, here, here's a, a potential question about inventors, Scottish inventors. And then I'll maybe do a little piece about that, a, a song or a poem or something relating to it to try and kind of get the audience excited about the fact uh, of this question. And then at the end they'll vote yes or no, I or no, do they want this question to be part of the future citizenship test? And by the end of the show we've created a document that says what questions we're going, we want to ask people uh, who want to become and be a citizen of Scotland. So it's almost like a trying to define what Scottishness well, is that, in that a modern was, day... That city. was kind of where we started, was uh, why... Uh, what makes you Scottish uh, and who gets to decide, yeah. basically. Aye. And those, those two questions kind of drove the whole thing uh, and took us to some weird places, uh, as you'll see if you come see the show. Um, but yeah, th- those were the kind of main tenets of, you know, wh- what is it that makes a person Scottish? What are those specific attributes? And are they actually unique to us? And who decided those were the Scottish things in the first place? <laughs> and who gets to decide if you are Scottish or can you just decide in your own right? Yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting question, such a difficult thing to answer because it's so complex yeah. and I love the idea of actually putting it out to an audience and mm-hmm. almost that kind of democratic answer yeah, coming back yeah, from it that's it and uh, so but as the show goes on we kind of find out that you know like all democracy you might have a a, a vote but it doesn't mean that it actually means anything at the end <laughs> of the day sure um, and we kind of start to understand that there's kind of bigger powers at work in the show and there's uh, and that Joe is kind of going on his own journey uh, in terms of his own identity and what Scotland means to him and how he's used it to, to form his personality 
Uh, so there's a few different strands. There's a personal one, there's a kind of universal one, and there's a political one, and they're all kind of interweaving throughout the show. So there's a narrative running through it as well with there's, Joe and yeah. Um, there's a personal narrative of Joe's relationship to himself and his father, um, but there's also the kind of wider narrative of uh, this organisation that he's working for and this government department and what are their intentions, and then the bigger universal thing of you know what makes us us is it the place that we're from is it the people we meet is it the things that we do what informs who we are as a, a human being so there's some big stuff in there for an hour long show so what, is, <laughs> what in, inspired you to take on this uh, big subject I think I just always wanted to write something about Scottish identity like I, I come from a kind of like classic uh, Glasgow Catholic you know, family where it was like you kind of grew up in this kind of weird limbo where it was like, yeah, I'm Scottish because I'm born here, but also it's like, you know, people play Irish rebel tunes when they're drunk on a Saturday night, and uh, and people go and see Charlie and the Boys, and uh, and people have Irish flags hanging from their uh, windows rather than Scottish ones. So I was always kind of you know, what that meant to me to kind of grow up in between and not feeling quite Scottish, but knowing that I wanted to and how all that kind of came into focus in 2014 when the referendum happened and it was like, oh, this is actually something I want and this is something I want to be a part of. But feeling that it wasn't 100% mine, maybe I didn't have full ownership of it. I, yeah, I wonder if that one of the reasons that so many people were against the idea of independence was that the definition of Scottishness they're not even happy with uh-huh. defining themselves in that way exactly. as you say there's other things that you kind of yeah, put onto that uh-huh. you know I'm a, yeah. I'm a British Scot I'm a Irish Scot I'm a whatever uh-huh. you know yeah exactly and I think that that concept was really interesting to me and how that I kind of struggled with that and then kind of came to terms with it and then post referendum, just watching the way the debate is just kind of falling into just complete point scoring nonsense and the complete lack of nuance and the fact that no one takes responsibility for anything, they're just all tribal. It's one side or the other mm-hmm. and there's no in between and there's no grey area and Politics exists entirely within that grey area, so it's mad to, to split it into no am right or am right. Um, so yeah, I wanted to really take that apart as well and explore that and my part in it and my complicity in it as well. Yeah. And have you um, done the show yet? Have you tried it out yet? I've I've done one a kind of work in progress preview down at the Coast Bird Festival oh, yes, down yes, in Dunbar. Yeah. Yep. Um, which is an amazing festival big shout out to Coast Bird and, and Hannah that runs the festival there uh, they do amazing stuff on a really small budget um, but yeah I took so I took the show there and it was it was wild it was great it was I, I was not expecting the level of uh, audience interactivity although that's built into the show for yeah. people to vote and feel that they're part of it it was it was going in crazy tangents because people were shouting things out they felt really kind of passionate about what was happening yeah. and they wanted to be a part of it uh, so it ended up being kind of going slightly over time slightly <laughs> and um, ended up being a bit uh, crazy and improv so it was really good fun so I, I'm kind of expecting a bit less of that in Edinburgh because I don't think people will be quite as drunk as they were at Coastwood <laughs> but <laughs> what, what, what time is your slot in Edinburgh? It's ten past five so that's no, that's not too bad actually yeah. that's pretty good <laughs> I wouldn't like to be doing this show at no, 10 o'clock at night or no, something. No, I would last two hours, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, so the audience reaction, it wasn't as simple as going uh, yes on one side, no on the other. It was a much more no, complex set of reactions, it, which I'm really interested yeah, in, and as you say, is that how it should be? Yeah, it seemed that it, what I was expecting was maybe there would be people voting along political lines for the, their own kind of political leanings but actually people were just voting on each individual subject as a as a thing Yeah. Um, so it was really interesting to see and for the most part everybody had kind of come to a conclusion uh, as a group yes or no for, for each uh, question that I asked because we start off really light and we're talking about language and we're talking about 
inventors and we're talking about you know fun Scottish stuff but then you know we are talking about health and we're talking about alcohol and we're talking about um, the Scottish cringe yeah and, uh, well it's interesting that you call the show suffering from Scottishness yeah. that idea that to be Scottish is to suffer yeah, in some yeah. way and you know the echoes of it's right being Scottish yeah. train spot and well, all that kind of stuff <laughs> That's a that's a line that pops up at the show <laughs> uh, because I, I needed to put that in there because that is one of those iconic moments of mm-hmm. kind of Scottish identity on screen is that kind of yell, um, yeah. So also a big shout to uh, Dumb Instrument who recorded the song "Suffering Absolutely. from Scottishness," which uh, is a great song. It's, an, ama- it. it's an amazing song. Yeah, so people should check that out. I, I I heard it years and years and years ago, and I went to see them a few times and really loved their music. And uh, and when I was coming to name this show, I was like, yeah, uh, it's really the only title that it deserved. Yeah, yeah there's some great lines in it. I like, <laughs> oh, for Christ's sake, I like shock tape, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, how are you feeling about? Is this your first Edinburgh show? It's not my first Edinburgh show. It's my fourth wow. Edinburgh show. But 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 this is the first one in a proper venue, a proper nice theatre venue uh, in the past I've done the free fringe yeah. and been stuck in a cupboard somewhere <laughs> or the basement I've seen a few of those shows <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah. I done, one year I'd done in a karaoke booth no no joke a karaoke booth one one year I was in the basement of a pub that had no door so I, I've i done my time basically yeah, I yeah, paid yeah. my dues and this is a in a, a proper venue Assembly Roxy yeah an assembly yeah beautiful space uh, and it's also part of the Disruption Festival, um, which is a collection of sh- six shows um, within uh, the Fringe at Assembly Roxy, all running throughout the day. Um, and it's kind of being promoted by Assembly and High Tide Theatre, which is a big right. company down in London. Um, yeah, and the, the, so the tagline is the, the best of new theatre. So, okay. <laughs> Go no, <with> no pressure. <laughs> and, and you think you might take it elsewhere? Because I, I think it sounds like a show that I, I definitely so, has the ability to. I so want to. I so want to. I think it will all depend on, uh, you know, funding as yeah, usual. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the show was kind of made with that in mind. I made it to be as portable and as easy to take to anywhere as possible. I was really inspired by the. Uh, the classic John McGrath play the, the TV yeah. the stagnant black black oil and the the way they went on that kind of uh, inaugural tour where they just went round everywhere in Scotland every yeah. little town hall village hall every theatre just taking it directly to people I would love to do something like that in the future uh, because it's and that's political cabaret as well. Oh yeah, of course. Like, and that—that that was the kind of same thing. Here, here's a wee poem. Here's a wee song. Here's a bit of politics with a serious message behind it. Yeah. Uh, but when you mix it all in together, it's quite a compelling thing to watch. Uh, but yeah, I feel quite strongly about taking it to uh, different communities because it's. It's their show. It's a show about Scottishness. It's a show it about Scottish identity. It would be fabulous to hear the different reactions from different exactly, parts of the country. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, because... Because the thing about Edinburgh in August, much as I love it, <laughs> uh-huh. often there's not that many Scots <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be a few kind there of... There will be, of the, course. ...of Scottish people in, as well as the, the American tourists, which will no doubt be drawn to the title after they went to see Ravi Burns the musical or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and is it a one man show is it just you on stage it's, or is that other it's just me on stage entirely for the full hour um, there's a couple of wee video interludes um, with uh, the amazing George Doherty the actor George Doherty right, he's yeah, playing, yeah. A, playing a character in the wee video interludes excellent um, he's great in it so th- those are wee treats um, but yeah, it's it's me and the audience just kind of thrashing it out for an hour and seeing where we get to at the end and kind of going on this wee uh, political and personal journey as we do it. I think as well, to, to talk to you now, it'd be lovely to talk to you at the end of the month. <laughs> Not just because you'll be exhausted, but yeah. like to see if the show has changed or if oh, you've changed it, you know, I, and all I, I that think, thing. Yeah, I think the, the way that it's been made especially... It, 
it's been made with so much flexibility built into it because I just know that it's going to go in different directions yeah. and every day it's going to be just a wee bit different and I'm just going to play it slightly different and I'm going to get something slightly different back and uh, as a performer that's so exciting actually rather than just learning the script and just doing yeah. it every day until you're, you're bored and you can do it with your eyes closed uh, to do it and know that something different is going to happen and that your energy is going to change uh, depending on what goes on I think that's really exciting and you know you said you've done a few Edinburgh's before how uh, what's your experience of Edinburgh at that time of year you know you find that a positive one? Oh no I hate it I hate <laughs> it <laughs> absolutely um, I'll always say my my main memory of, of Edinburgh is doing the, doing the fringe and, and crying on the Megabus home with a bottle of wine because I've had a, a horrible show and five people have turned up and one of them fell asleep and somebody shouted at me and people have taken my flyers and scrunched them up in front of my face and thrown them in the bin and yeah it's, it's, a, hard, That's it's, it's, it's a hard slog you know? I remember going to see an amazing show using the based on the music of Sigur Ross it was a wow. cracking show and there was only two of us in the audience there was five folk on stage it's hard like I, I've done shows where it has been literally three people in the room and see try to keep your energy up for an hour yeah. with three people just looking at you and you can see the <laughs> they look at their faces which is just give it up man go home but uh, yeah I think you do that and you pay your dues you and, pay your dues yeah, yeah and after a while you kind of you get better and you, you move up the ladder a wee bit so that hopefully that's the start of this and I'll be in a nice uh, shiny venue every year that sounds like a fascinating show I must say um, so the next thing I'd like to talk to you about because I see we've got lots to cover mm-hmm. is um, Sad Songs for White Boys which is your uh, poetry collection which yeah. is, uh, comes out on the 16th of July comes out 16th of July yes and uh, it's a collection over of the last decade really yeah 10 years well ov- obviously everyone's been pulling me up on the title because it's 2010 to, to, <laughs> to 2020 that. I was like it just looks better like, I, <laughs> I, I wish I had more of a, a reason to give you rather than an aesthetic one but 2010 to 2020 looks amazing yep uh, and obviously I'm just future proofing it for a year as well exactly. so that's fine exactly um, but yeah so it's coming out 16th of July uh, it's been published by Speculative Books oh who yeah are an amazing uh, DIY kind of a uh, publisher in Glasgow uh, and they've got an amazing kind of subscription service that they run where you pay I think it's £7 a month and a new book of poetry comes through your letterbox every month yeah. for that uh, so yes uh, uh, it's a collection of stuff over the past 10-ish years um, and it's amazing to, to go back and the stuff from right at the start yeah. Um, when I like was turning up at open mics and just reading these wee poems with my hand shaking uh, to stuff that's in the, the Edinburgh show. There's a couple of poems that are in the show that, that are going to be time. in that book. Yeah, so it's really amazing to see it all together. Uh, and I've deliberately kind of not put any context as to when each poem was written. So there's some really early stuff right beside some uh, recent okay, stuff. Okay, so it's not done chronologically. No, no, it's all over the place, um, which was really exciting to just kind of find its own wee kind of listing um, because it's just creating a new reading of the poems as well, you know, when a thing that I've been reading for, for eight years uh, and, and now comes after a new poem and suddenly the meaning is just slightly changed by what yeah, you've read beforehand. So... Yeah, that's really exciting to, to put all that together. And I, I, I hopefully it, it feels like a kind of line drawn under the, the kind of first chapter of my, my poetry writing career as well. I think that's a really interesting point that maybe maybe folk do think about it, but um, when you read uh, poetry and short stories, but particularly poetry, what you're reading is completely affected by the one you've just read and the one that you read afterwards yeah, and that's yeah. why it, it makes sense if someone has thought about how this works as a whole how this works mm-hmm. as a whole collection rather than going you know 2020 yeah. January through to ever yeah I mean I, I kind of toyed with it but I was like it's so much more fun to kind of recontextualise all that stuff and find uh, some new meanings within it by 
uh, its placement within the book as a whole so I really hope people enjoy that and get a wee kick out of it as well I mean you said you paid your dues in, in, in Edinburgh and you certainly paid your dues I think on the spoken word scene for <laughs> yeah, all that length of time yeah. before we go into that in more depth uh, could you read us maybe a couple of things of course yeah um, I think I'll start with this one this, this is one of my kind of calling card poems that I do quite often in my sets just because um, it kind of deals with the poetry world uh, and deals with uh, my my general hatred of all other poets <laughs> uh, so it's called I've fallen out of love with poetry I've fallen out of love with poetry it's no me it's you that spark has gone wandering amidst countless painful open mics anxiety inducing slams colleague politics and the complete absence of ever being paid. <laughs> I've fallen out of love with poetry because of your fucking whiny voices and earnest subject matter, <sighs> contrivedly crafted for universal agreement. I'm glad we've sorted out that racism is bad. I was a wee bit sketchy till you took the mic. <laughs> I've fallen out of love with poetry with your mid-Atlantic inflections and borrowed speech patterns because you all learn to slam from Americans on YouTube instead of saying what you feel. I've fallen out of love with poetry because your body issues are not important, unlike mine. Of course you're an outsider, you read fucking poetry. This is a club for weirdos, this much we know. I've fallen out of love with poetry because you write too many love poems and they don't come easily to me. Grand metaphors like quixotic sculpture hewn from the marble of your affections or something. I've fallen out of love with poetry because rhyming is seen as uncool despite it being a useful linguistic Two, a literary device taught to kids at school Yet I stand up here like a mawkish ghoul Cos my poetic preference marks me out as a fool Or something I've fallen out of love with poetry Because these young people Are actually quite good And maybe there's no room for a grown man's Weary compositions and chronic oversharing I've fallen out of love with poetry because it's fallen out of love with me. Fantastic. And uh, I'm interested, we're talking about it over the last 10 years. When did you write that one? Um, I think that, that's that been about for a wee while now. That's, <laughs> that's maybe kind of five, six years old now, yeah. Um, I kind of get a wee bit disillusioned with uh, going to poetry slams and everyone sounding like they were trying to be from New York and uh, doing the kind of the classic slam poetry voice and doing the weird intonations and stops and yeah yeah uh, there was a kind of rhythm that was uh, you, you see the YouTube clips yeah the rhythms, those type of things uh, but you know so you um, uh, run Sonic Youth with Cat uh, yeah. and uh, it's I mean it's I've been to quite a few nights it's, it's almost a cabaret in itself, isn't it? Because yeah. you've got spoken words, you've got music, you've got comedians, you've got that kind of thing. Was That's that something it. that was really important to you to do rather than just have, a, a, you know, a kind of... I mean, it, it didn't start like that. It started as just a, a, a straight poetry night. Um, and I think we, for the first kind of year we were doing it and it was kind of like six or eight poets on in a bill. And then it was getting to the end of the night and I was like looking at Kat and I'm like, I can't even hear any of my poetry yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah, yeah. there's always so much poetry I can pay attention to so and I'm a poet your, yes absolutely <laughs> no, no, I think that's interesting yeah and so I'm, I'm thinking geez, uh, the audience members that are turning up and they're listening to eight different people do ten minutes of poetry each and it was just it, it was a bit much and uh, and we'd kind of started to bring comedians in and I was like this is great and then I was like what if we get a wee bit of music in what if we get a rapper in? What mm-hmm. if we get a cabaret act in? Yep. What if we get some authors in to read some short stories? 
and it all just kind of came together into what it is now, which is, yeah, we call it a spoken word cabaret. Yeah. Um, a spoken word house party, uh, as our tagline goes. Uh, so, yeah, we have a very specific format now where we have a kind of uh, a new act, a, a kind of up-and-comer uh, that we, we've seen a few times and we want to give them yeah, yeah. A, a slot to kind of uh, show, show what they've got. But also, it's really important for new artists to know that you get paid sometimes. Yeah, very because, much so. <laughs> yeah, and, and we are one of the few nights in Scotland that actually pays people. And I think we're the only regular spoken word night that pays kind of proper rates so it's good for these young artists to get their first paid gig under the belt absolutely um, but then yeah we also have a comedian and we'll have a kind of wild card act which could be a cabaret act or it could be a singer songwriter or it could be something just really weird that we found yeah and, and usually somebody from the kind of literary community and you know, some a big headliner, hopefully as well. Yeah. Without being cruel, what's the weirdest act you've had? The on? weirdest act. Um, we've had some great cabaret stuff. Um, Marky the saw is amazing. If right. you've ever, if you've ever witnessed her, she. I mean, she literally yeah. plays a saw. Right, it's, excellent. It's, it's, it's fantastic. That, and that's an art form that's lost. <laughs> well, well that's it. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, all these guys turned up to, to see well. to see a bit of. Uh, see a bit of stand-up comedy and they ended up getting somebody playing Moon River on a saw and it was just <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's it that's what I love about Sonic Youth and yeah. and the fact that we run it over multiple nights now it means that you know all the art acts that come together they all get to know each other and there's little relationships that form there and future collaborations and so yeah we're really happy with how it's going um, it is the end of the season just now uh, but we'll hopefully secure some funding and be back later on in the year with a whole bunch of new shows as well. Because you say you do different nights and in different spaces and places yeah, as yeah. well. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so the, there's the classic kind of monthly nights, which are our cabaret nights. Uh, so those have been running at uh, Drygate uh, in Glasgow and Gilded Balloon in Edinburgh, and they kind of run on consecutive nights. Um, and but we also do our um, scratch night over at Phillies in Shawlands, mm-hmm. um, which is a great uh, venue, and that's there to kind of give people a chance to come up and try new work, basically. So we'll we'll pay professional acts to come up and just try out new ideas and do whatever they want for a wee while. We also have an open mic section where kind of people that we don't know can come and do a wee bit and kind of get a performance under their yeah. belt. Uh, as well as that we do kind of one-off collaborations with Toonspeak Young People's Theatre yeah. uh, who are amazing so that that's a similar thing in terms of we, we book a few professional acts and then the young people will share their work in between it so they get to kind of share the stage with professional acts uh, and also one-off stuff like the, the Sun Youth Weekender mm-hmm. uh, the Tron Theatre yes um, which was great which was a couple of kind of uh, theatre shows and a uh, kind of showcase Sonic Youth show um, and yeah I mean we're really open to stuff we're also producing shows now and directing shows excellent so we, we are producing a theatre show called Fixed Skin Elastic Heart uh, by Drew Taylor Wilson that's going to be on tour in the autumn so that'll be a, that's a full uh, Scottish tour that's going on which we've kind of produced and booked wow. and done all this stuff for which is hard work by the way <laughs> if anybody ever asks you to be a producer definitely just say no I mean doing all this stuff I think a lot of people will be interested in just how you manage to do it <laughs> you know the logistics of it so are you going to tell me that there's uh, some dodgy uh, taxing going on or that some kind of <laughs> money changing hands but um, no seriously it's, it's it's hugely difficult to have any kind of career in the arts these days uh-huh. and to have a kind of um cultural creative life for want of a better term yeah, yeah. is a really tough thing to do yeah. and I think you know it sounds like you don't have time for anything else so how, how is that? No that's I mean I, I'm full time with the full time artist which is a weird thing um, it's really precarious like really precarious on a monthly basis on a day to day basis <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it has been possible for the last two and a half years now since I went proper freelance so 
that's exciting and it's really nice that I get to make my living doing the stuff that I love absolutely um, but I mean I, I'm lucky that I love so many different things and I can diversify slightly yeah. and, uh, so it's like you know I can do workshops and then I can write plays and I can um, run Sonic Youth and I can sell some books and sell some albums and you know between all those things it's some semblance of a living um, but yeah it's it's a really hard shift just now uh, and obviously it's getting harder because funding's getting cut all over yeah, the place yeah. and, and schools have less money to be getting artists in to do workshops and yeah so it is, it is all yeah, very, things very like hard writers in residence are losing That's, the funding uh, and all of that kind of stuff yeah so it's all very hard just now but also uh, I'm very privileged to be doing it to be honest you know it's amazing like I used to work in shitey call centres and I used to work in for Glasgow museums and I used to uh, work in nightclubs and yeah you've, you've mean, paid your dues yeah, there as well yeah yeah <laughs> so it feels nice to be to be doing the stuff that I love even if it is stressful even if it is hard and even if it is underpaid I still get to do what I love on a daily basis so that's something that's it's brilliant and what I would say to anyone who hasn't been to a Sonic Youth Night is um, they're always great nights and they I've been to a few at Phillies mm. and that's usually it's a Thursday night isn't yeah, it so you think in the middle of the week yeah, or yeah. whatever but the audience are so up for it <laughs> yeah I think it's just Again, the, the thing we're talking about taking it to a community, just taking something right into a pub in the south side, and people are like, all right, cool, don't need to go into town for this, it's exactly. right here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. They'll, they'll just have a few drinks and get into it and have good fun. And, and it's the same having one in East End and exactly, Drygate as well. Exactly, yeah, but. yeah. So people are into it, and, uh, and I think people come in kind of expecting one thing and leave thinking, oh, it's something completely different, yeah. which I love. And it means that hopefully they, they'll go and tell their pals, oh, there's this weird thing happening in, in a pub in Shawlands or in Drygate or in Gilded Balloon or wherever it happens to be. I took a pal of mine uh, and I was, was like, I don't know if this is my kind of thing, whatever. <laughs> and she left just going, oh, that was amazing. And she got <laughs> chatting to one of the poets that was there. Too, amazing. And, and that's, uh, yeah, they're, they're great nights. Love it. Yeah. Um, but we started talking about poetry, talking about your collection. Yeah. Could you read us another uh, yeah. poem from it? That'd be amazing. Definitely. I'll maybe read this one. Actually, this is this is actually one that appears in the the Friends show as well. So it's a wee Excellent. nice crossover here. Uh, so this one's called My Quantum Scotland. This is not a country. It is a contradiction shaped as a landmass. A polarity carved carelessly into ancient hills, a dual personality imbued into every brick of our grand cities. A wound bound together by a shared history of oppression and the occasional sporting near miss. We are a binary people, a simultaneous society, split personality, two places at once. Because this is the land of Catholics and Protestants, Celtic and Rangers, Glasgow and Edinburgh, Jekyll and Hyde, Nationalists and Unionists, Remainers and Leavers, yes and no, where the wind howls and the rain lashes and the heather is slightly perturbed. And this explains the listlessness that permeates, the rift at the centre of my Caledonian heart because you buffed me all misshapen and angry and here I am yours truly and truly yours my quantum Scotland Caledonian antisysogy a constantly repeated anomaly square pegs and round holes the jigsaw pieces from the other side of the board forced into imperfect union there are two of us living side by side forever in dispute like warring siblings of fractious neighbours. Because this is a land of highlands and lowlands, landed gentry and slum dwellers, Bears Den and Drum Chapel, Beaujolais and Buckfast, Cybernats and Norbags, Salt and Vinegar and Salt and Sauce, Mogwai and the Proclaimers, No and Yes. Where the wind howls, and the rain lashes and the heather is slightly perturbed 
And this explains the listlessness that permeates, the rift at the centre of my Caledonian heart because you buffed me, all misshapen and angry. And here I am, yours truly and truly yours, my quantum Scotland. How did we get this far? With a fatal injury inflicted in our infancy, the blood trail annotating our journey, the cleaving apart of a society. Open the shop red tin in the wardrobe, liberate the needle and thread, and stitch these two cloths together until something resembles a nation where the wind howls and the rain lashes and the heather is slightly perturbed. Excellent. Yeah. And there's not many uh, poems that reference the Caledonian antecedent. <laughs> get that well, in. that's that's a whole big <laughs> section of the show. So, oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, we, that was a really important concept that actually kind of came up in the when we were developing the show. Um, it kind of came up, and I was like, "What? What does this mean?" And the more we searched it, the more I was like, "Oh, that's it. This is the exact thing that I've been thinking about and talking about, but I didn't know what, what it was it called." Was. Yeah, it's the separation yeah. between the heart and the head, and yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the, the minute I realised, I was like, "Right, this is it." Uh, so there's a part in the show where I kind of. Uh, educate the audience in that as well because I don't think a lot of people do know no, what no, it I is because so. I studied Scottish literature yeah. and I got to study Hugh McDermott and yeah. I came up with the term yeah. originally so yeah um, so you said you've been performing for, for, for 10 years from those early days yeah. how do you think the um, performance spoken word scene has it changed is it better has it always been quite healthy in those um, no, it's definitely better there's there's more people doing it it's, yeah. it's more popular um, when I started there was only really a couple of wee nights in Glasgow yeah. and there were more open mic nights than anything else of course there was like a history of stuff before that but when I started there was mainly just uh, last Monday at Rio which was over mm. at the old Rio Cafe yeah, in, yeah. in Partick um, which was a great night um, we run by uh, Robin Cairns yes um, so that that's kind of where I started uh, you know I kind of turned up there once a month with a, a wee poem that I'd written and I'd get up and, and try it out and kind of progress to uh, doing a headline set yeah. there which was like a, the first time I'd really headlined and got like a full 15, 20 minutes to, to read a full set of poems so uh, yeah it, it's definitely progressed it's definitely become more of a younger thing mm-hmm. when, when I was when I first started I was the youngest person by far yeah. um, whereas now it feels like very much a student A based thing and um, I would say that in terms of poetry and spoken word it feels like it's reached the stage uh-huh. where it's kind of went into strands and kind of subgenres, right. and uh, so that's quite interesting. Before it was just everybody was just lumped in. Here's, yeah. here's the poets. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. We've we'll got the poet at the end yeah, of the night or something like that. Yeah. Whereas now it's kind of oh, this is a slam poetry night, and this is an experimental night, and this is a kind of uh, page poetry night, mm. and you know, so the. It's kind of going in different directions, which is interesting to see. And I think there are more, it seems to me, small publishers that are focusing on poetry mm-hmm. and publishing poetry, which yeah, is great, because for a while amazing. that was a really difficult thing to Definitely. get done. Definitely, there was only a couple of them, and there were bigger ones, and they wouldn't really take a risk on, yeah. especially spoken word poetry, because, you know, it's you know it's great for performing in rooms full of people. Sometimes it doesn't look great on the yeah, page. Yeah, yeah, Some, sure. Sometimes you you kind of need that connection to the, the live performance um, so it was hard as a, a spoken word performer to kind of feel that you were part of that it just felt like you weren't really allowed that credibility uh, of being part of the full you know kind of literary scene uh, I think that's kind of changing a wee bit I think those barriers are kind of coming down a wee bit be- between the, the page and the stage yeah yeah and when you were putting the collection together were there ones that you think well, they, I know they work really well Live, but I'm not going to include them. Or yeah, there was a couple like that um, where it's just it just doesn't work on yeah, the page, yeah. which is fine. It's a, yeah, it's a, no, it's a, diff- it's a it's different thing in a way, absolutely. And, and there's ones where I just kind of had to be a wee bit creative with the way it's laid out on the page to try and give it that li- live feel or the way that it's read, maybe kind of. Uh, 
give the impression that the, the words are falling in a certain way but to be honest I think most people that will buy the book will have seen me live yeah and it, yeah. yeah so I feel like they're going to have that connection to oh that that's that they'll poem. hear your voice probably yeah, when they're reading it poor people they will but, um, <laughs> yeah. no, but that's the thing but that, that, that's it and I feel like hopefully that means that the poems that they might not have heard me perform they can at least contextualise it within my voice and, and how I would yeah. say things and how it would come out and how I, I'd want it to be heard yeah um, I said at the beginning that the first time I heard of you was with Glasgow Cross your band yeah. so let's finish off by talking a bit about your music <laughs> yeah so yeah Kevin Peagle Day and the Glasgow Cross that's the, the kind of musical project that I'm involved in just now Um so it, it sounds like it's multiple people it's actually just me and, <laughs> uh, it, I didn't know and, that. and uh, Ralph right. uh, Hector who is the guy behind uh, Iffy Folk yes. Records yes 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 um, they're a fantastic small label really, yeah really, really they label. are so, so it's basically it just started as like a wee kind of collaboration I, I collaborated with uh, Ralph's previous band the Sea Kings all right who were a great band mm-hmm. um Unfortunately, they're not making music anymore. But the, yeah, I'd kind of loved them, and I'd done a support slot for them at their album launch. And we just kind of stayed in touch. And their their singer um, was had kind of moved down south for a while, and they wanted they kind of maybe do a wee one off project. So uh, I ended up doing this kind of uh, double A side single with them for for Record Store Day called uh, Glasgow Overture. Right. I think it's still online somewhere. It'll be right, on okay. YouTube and everything. Um, and it was great it was fun um, the, that band kind of ended after that but Ralph wanted to kind of collaborate on some stuff after that so it started just as a project where Ralph was like I'll write some music to go with your poetry right basically okay I, I'll, I'll compose some music so you don't need to do anything the poems are as they are and then the, the music can just kind of fit, which fit makes sense because the first stuff I heard was you're kind of spoken as you yeah, delivering yeah. poetry here with the, with the music behind it. So is that still an ongoing? Still, still an ongoing yeah. Thing? So it kind of grew and grew, and the, the more we got into it, the more the more we enjoyed it. And we, so we started doing it live, and obviously live it, it, it becomes this different thing because there's drum machines going and the synths going and there's different rhythms so it ended up I kind of was fitting the poems to the music and the music was fitting to the poems yeah. and they ended up becoming this this weird thing in between which was really exciting um, and we've been writing new music as well so we've recorded the first we've got the first six songs of a oh, new brilliant. album excellent um, I'm not allowed to share them yet no because they're, they're not <laughs> quite there yet but uh, but they're really exciting stuff and I've and they're not anything like the first album. There's right. a bit of spoken word there, but I'm singing for the most right. part. So How is that? It's great. I mean, that that's what I used to do before yeah. the poetry. I was in bands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were all terrible, but I was, <laughs> I, was, I was in bands and I'd kind of, you know, they all done okay and then split up and they never quite yeah. got anywhere. The usual story. Yeah. And I was kind of like, oh, I can't be, can't be arsed with these people anymore musicians I would just write poetry and do it myself and then I've ended up kind of coming full circle yeah. and being back in a band again <laughs> um, but yeah it's really exciting so there'll be new Glasgow Cross stuff out uh, hopefully towards the end of this year if not the next year but yeah there's Excellent. going to be a whole new album of tracks uh, which I'm really excited about sharing with people because it's very different and very new and I think some of the best stuff I've ever worked on so yeah fantastic excited. well Kevin, thanks very much for talking to us today. Could well, I uh, ask your indulgence to read one more poem before of course. we finish? Um, okay, I, I'll do this one. It's a wee short one, uh, and it seems appropriate just now with the uh, the Tory leadership race and all the rest of it. Uh, so this is how to spot a Tory. <laughs> if you don't say cheers, mate, when you go off the bus then you're probably a Tory. If you don't watch The Simpsons at six o'clock, then you're probably a Tory. If you've never been sick at the Pleasure Beach in Blackpool, then you're probably a Tory. If you've never had to use a Coinstar machine to buy a bottle of wine, then you're probably a Tory.
Tory. If you're not sure what football team you support, then you're probably a Tory. If you're unsure of the etiquette in regards to your granny being on a bus, then you're probably a Tory. If you didn't have a party when Thatcher died, then you're probably a Tory. If you don't shout, get it right up you, you old cunt, every time the Queen is on the telly, then you're probably a Tory. If you don't lament the loss of gingy bottles as a self-contained economic currency, then you're probably a Tory. If you get someone else to iron your clothes, in fact, if you even iron your clothes, then you're probably a Tory. But if you think that wealth trickles down, that doctors are overpaid, that immigration is eroding the country, that privatisation is the key, that poverty is a myth, then you're definitely a fucking Tory. Cheers, Kevin, and thanks <laughs> Thank very you. much for that. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be back soon uh, with someone completely different. Cheers. Cheers.